The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. Today we're coming to you live from Salem, New Hampshire, and we are going to talk about the 10 breeds to avoid if you have young children in the house or if you plan on having young children in the house. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. All right, my quirky tip of the day is if you follow the dog daddy on YouTube, he's gaining a lot of traction here in our industry and everything else. Some of his videos are quite entertaining and kind of just, I don't know, they have a lot of things people like to watch him. He is not really doing the best for our industry. If he would like to talk to us personally, we can chat this all up, but it's more of a sensationalized thing. If you're doing a seminar someplace, you don't you know, invite spectators, you invite auditors. It's just, it's not really dog training that we want to promote to the public or in our industry. And the way YouTube works is it's an algorithm. So the more people watch, the more people comment, the more hype he gets, the more it kind of amps up. So just be conscious of that. If you're looking for good YouTube content, the McCanns have good YouTube content. Emily Larlam has a lot of good YouTube content. Susan Garrett has a lot of good YouTube content. Learberg, there's a lot of places out there to look. So if the dog daddy is one of your subscriptions, our quirky tip is maybe unsubscribe this week. What were you going to say, babe? I'm not going to comment one way or the other. I think, (laughs) yeah, it's a lot of uh, dog aggression and uh, exciting videos, but Not super productive, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's not really what we want to put out there and promote to the public. So, with that said, that is our quirky tip. Today, we are talking about breeds to avoid with kids. And um, I came up with a list. I had Scott come up with a list. I asked on Facebook, kind of, just for some general feedback of what people were thinking. And honestly, I hate to say it, but I didn't kind of turn the Facebook feedback into podcast breed stuff as much. It just wasn't kind of where we were resonating. So... Let's start with the places that Scott and I came together on breeds from our list and his list. And we're going to do 10 breeds all together. Our last category is kind of a miscellaneous category, so there'll be more than one herding breed listed. But the places that we came together, we had three breeds that we came together on, breeds. So those three were pit bulls. Akitas and wolf hybrids. So let's flush those out kind well, of wolf hybrid as isn't we start. A breed. I know that's why I did my air quotes that's with a... breed. Yeah. So this was something that when he made his list and I made my list, we definitely came together on those to start with. So let's start with the pit bull in general. I guess that's an easy one to start with. And for all you pit bull lovers out there, I know many of you live with pit bulls that are great with young children. And many of these breeds you already have coexisting with children, and it's awesome. This is a general PSA that if you are pregnant, or if you plan on having young children in the house frequently, you know, your grandkids or whatever coming over, these are breeds that are kind of like buyer beware, be conscious of having them around young children. So let's start with a bang with a pit bull. Well, I will say, you know, I've never owned a pit bull, so I feel a little out of place even commenting on it. And also, I'm, you know, most every dog I come in contact with where people are paying me, there's problems with the dogs. But I will say, uh, my brother was looking for a family dog a few years back. And he asked me, what do you think I should get? And I was I have some good friends um, that are pit bull fanatics and, and breeders. And I contacted them and said, what do you think about my brother getting a pit bull? He's got two kids. And both of them said, no, absolutely <laughs> not. And these are people that love pit bulls. These are people that know the breed inside and out. They love working with pit bulls. And um, both of them seemed a little bit burnt yeah. on the breed. I yeah. Mean, uh, they're a lot to handle, to manage, and uh, they are great, especially if you're a trainer. There's a lot of pit bulls that have a ton of drive, that are real trainable. They look great. They're a ton of fun because they're so athletic, but not the best dog to have running around with a three or four-year-old kid on the ground, you know? Yeah, and even when you look at some basic statistics, this was something done in 2021, there were over 3,397 pit bull attacks and 295 of those attacks resulted in deaths. And we all know that we see a lot of news stories popping up, a lot of stuff on social media about pit bulls, and the pit, pit bull people will say, oh, you know, they're prejudiced towards this breed and everything else. Well, there can't be this number of incidences of these attacks with the news covering them, and they're just ignoring all the other breeds covering them. So I will just say straight up here that 
The Pitbulls, the American Pitbull Terrier, the breed that AKC does not recognize, has been bred with dog aggression. That's just the bottom line. That's what, how they were supposed to be bred. That's the essence of who they are. Some of these attacks on young children may not be actual human aggression. They could be more prey-driven. They hear a noise, something else. It gets them into a different state. If you have a mauled child or a dead child at the end of it, it doesn't matter either way. The, the nuance of it doesn't matter. It's just not necessarily a safe breed with children. And I have a lot of friends that you know, are on my Facebook page and listen to the podcast from high school and college and everything else. They're young people with families and everything. And I would just say professionally, I would not recommend rescuing a dog from the shelter with pit bull in it or going to get a pit bull if you have young children in the house. That's where I stand. That's my professional opinion. And we're trying to give you guys the best information out here as possible. I don't support breed specific legislation. I'm not trying to be anti pit bull. I think they're a great dog. I don't think they should just all be euthanized and everything else. It doesn't have to be in a family with young kids. If you're a couple that doesn't plan on having children or, you know, you're a single bachelor and you don't plan on wanting to have kids in your life and you don't have young nieces and nephews over, fine. I, I'm not saying don't own a pit bull. We're not saying they're bad dogs. Or but when they're specifically going to be with young children, mm -hmm. I would be conscious of it. If you don't like kids, that might be a good breed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they clean just... Up, clean up the yard It's quick. attack after attack after attack. And I mean, this has been going on for a long, long time. You can research it. The Colby pit bulls, they're out of Newburyport. They had a death of, you know, a nephew in their family in the early 1900s. This is not new information. This is not, you know, oh, the world's anti this breed and everything else. There are triggers, whatever happens, whatever the situation looks like, there are more attacks on children and there are more deaths with children with pit bulls than any other breed. So just be conscious of it, buyer beware. And if you choose to make that choice and get great training and know the genetics and everything else, that's fine. It does not mean that the pit bull that lives in your house with your young children is going to be a problem or you are an irresponsible dog owner. There's going to be exceptions to every single breed we talk about on this podcast. It does mean, however, if you are planning to introduce a dog into your family and you also want to start a family, you know, your family process or whatever they call that family planning in the next few years, those two may not mesh well. You can look at another breed. There are a lot of dog breeds out there. I will say if we're getting ready to move on to the next breed. Are we done if, with pit bulls? We can be if done. If you are going to get a pit bull, I would definitely get a puppy from a respected breeder that knows what they're breeding Yeah. and then raise it with training and make sure that you're, you know, crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's yeah. so you have the best shot at having a great adult dog, just like you would with any other breed. Yeah, but, but if you're not super dog savvy and if you don't have, you know, some way to channel this dog's drive, the true American pit bull terriers are bred to have a job. They're bred to work. They're bred to be muscular and amazing athletes, like some of the best athletes in the world. If you just want a family house pet, they're not necessarily your best go-to. They need more than that. They cr thrive with that mentally physically, everything else. So just be conscious of the decision you're making because bringing a dog into your house with children is a big decision. Yeah. And I will say any, any dog that is bred with animal aggression, which includes most all the terriers, uh, you need to keep that in mind. Yeah. And even though they've been kind of, they try to breed that stuff out of them now that they're more companion animals, most of these terrier breeds, it's still back there in their DNA. And it may be that they have no human aggression at all, but you can't have a cat. You can't have any other animal in the house. You can't walk down the street because your neighbors have dogs that come out and then your dog has a problem. Yeah. Things to consider. Yeah. So that, that is our number one first breed we're talking about, pit bulls. All right. We took a long time on pit bulls. We're going to keep moving. Akitas were another breed we came together on. Why did you mention the Akita, sweetie? Oh, I have. I know people that have been bit in the face by Akitas. So yeah. uh, they're known to have aggression issues. Yep. Yeah. Um, that being said, I mean, well, I, we just had Nikita puppy and the dog was awesome. Yeah. Nice puppy. Yeah. These really, are not breeds that we're really trying nice to hate puppy. on. These are not breeds that we're saying shouldn't exist. These are not breeds that we're saying that breeders are irresponsible for breeding them. We are saying as a general rule, you may want to be careful with kids. And even yeah. on the AKC website, and AKC is very unbiased normally when they talk about breeds. They're promoting well, most they're breeds. they're very pro-dog. Yeah. They Put want you to way. breed. They want you to do these things. It says on their website, the Akita is wary of strangers and often intolerant of other animals. So that's fine, but they're wary of strangers. That's not just, you know, adults. That could get, be kids coming on your property, too. grandkids, anything else. So yes, they definitely get big. They're a larger breed. And most of the Akitas that we have gotten in have had some sort of aggression here, there, or somewhere else. And like Scott said, we did this puppy. 
he was awesome, but he was young and he was getting molded into the dog that he was supposed to get, you know, become. And Akitas are not a good dog for a first time dog owner. Akitas are not a good dog for someone that doesn't understand the breed at all. Is that um, Hachi, what, that movie Hachi, was he an yes. Akita? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Great dog. A lot of face yes. kissing in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think they had to replace uh, Richard Gere or yeah. send him in for and, plastic surgery. And they can be amazing dogs and they can be amazing companions. But if that is your breed and your children now are thinking about having children and you're going to be having your grandkids over, you know, for those first five years of their life and everything else, maybe get another dog in between before they're old enough to be able to, you know, kind of be at least the same height as the dog and everything else. So Akitas, we came together on. And then the last one. And again, with Akitas, uh, get proactive with the training. Yeah. Start right away. Don't wait until there's a problem. The average pet dog, uh, the average client I have, it's all reactive training. Oh, my yes. dog did this. My dog did that. I need to get some training. Get in on the front end. You, you may never, you don't want the dog to be expressing parts, these aspects of their genetics that you don't ever want to see. There's yeah. no need to see that. And if you don't let them express this, uh, this instinctual behavior, it's almost like they don't know they have it. It's yeah. very easy to keep it under control. It doesn't continue on the front to end. grow. Yes, yeah. that's true. That's true. And a lot of people would say you suppress it, it's going to come out somewhere else. We're telling you right now. Get on top of them from the get-go. All right, the last one we came together on, and Scott is correct, this is not a dog breed, but this is an animal that people are bringing into their homes, was the wolf hybrid. And it was on your list, it was yeah. on my list, and well, I mean, it's a freaking wolf. They're <laughs> sketch well, they're, they're not a wolf. A wolf would be better. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather well, have true. a full-blooded full, full -blooded wolf yeah. in my house than a mix, because these mixes are typically really sketchy. They're, they have this, the ones I've dealt with, they're especially aloof. They're borderline fearful of humans. It's yeah. just a genetic predisposition. And I had a lady call me in New Hampshire that had a, a wolf hybrid that they were having trouble with. And of course, I say, you know, why would you get a wolf hybrid? You know, you know, trying to just question, not judge, but question what brought you to get to this point. And so I went to the state of Maine, like requirements to own a wolf hybrid. And they have very strict, uh, you could have a fence that's like, six or eight feet high and you need to make sure that your your wolf hybrid cannot get loose and this is one of the problems they were having was the dog was running down the street doesn't come doesn't want to come to humans and uh, you can get into huge trouble if your wolf hybrid bites somebody and you'd have less of a problem if you had a pit bull yeah and i believe you have they're, a dog. i believe they're illegal in they're not many illegal. places no well in some places yeah. they, i'm sure they are yeah but they also, for example, in New Hampshire, you can have one, but you got to register the dog and you, or the, the wolf hybrid, and the you animal. have to somewhat contain it like you, like you own a wild animal. Yeah. That's part of the deal. Yeah. I mean, we, we contain all our dogs almost like they're wild animals. <laughs> we don't have dogs escape yeah. from, from fenced areas. Yeah, no, that's we've, true. We've never had it, I don't think. No, it's true. But there are different regulations yeah. for the size of the fence, everything else. And that same list from 2021 where the pit bulls had crazy high numbers, and this is a tax on humans, not just kids, but we can translate, you know, the way things go. The wolf hybrids had 85 attacks, and those resulted in 19 deaths. So a lot of dogs attack. This is not to say that, oh, these are the five breeds you should get if you have children, and this breed will never attack. No, every dog can bite. Every type of dog can turn bad. Any breed of dog, anything else. But when these attacks are resulting in deaths, we're talking about another level of aggression, you guys. Like, that is not just a single bite that needed stitches. We're talking about a, an animal that would not come off, that kept aggressing, that kept escalating, that kept, you know, inciting itself with the noise and everything else from the attack. So we are talking about another level of aggression. And I, I do want to add, though, that uh, Omar yes. von Mueller had a wolf hybrid that I met. The dog was incredible. Yeah. He had this dog really well trained. He's, you know, one of the best trainers in the in the country, certainly. He's the movie guy. He was on our and, podcast uh, he was a few years the, back. He was using this uh, wolf hybrid in the movies as a wolf. But it was a dog that wasn't so like a like a wild animal yeah. where you gotta be super careful. His dog was acted more like a dog. Yeah. But that was you know, so much based on the way he raised and well, trained and that's, that dog. That's the thing about any of these dogs we're mentioning. Any of these breeds in the right hands are more than fine with children if you're, you know, capable of raising the breeds and creating structure and creating a household setup. We're talking about the average Joe yeah. family 
introducing an animal or a dog into their home, let's not have it be a pit bull or an Akita or a wolf hybrid, yeah, okay? Imagine an eight-year-old's birthday party in the backyard with 15, 20 yeah, kids. We're not going to have a, a wolf hybrid not, floating around. Not a, a little bit of a stressful situation, not I would smart. Think, for me. Not I a smart be, situation. We're I'd not advising. We're not advising that. All right, let's go to break super quick, and when we get back, we'll talk about our last seven. Want to keep up with all the latest from the Quirky Dog Podcast like me and Murphy here? Then make sure you head on over to the YouTube channel and subscribe. Or if you prefer to listen to the madness, go on over to iTunes or Spotify and follow the Quirky Dog Podcast. And hey, while you're there, leave a rating and review and let them know what you think of the show. Until then, keep it quirky. All right, so this is where we kind of had to chat it up. We only came together on these three. I think Scott had English Bulldog on his list. We didn't go the Bulldog route. Um... I didn't really want to pursue that. I had, I had a very short list yeah. because I hate to. He was. He didn't even want to do this. He, yeah, minds. he didn't even want to do this podcast. I just thought it was a good public service announcement to talk to people out there. We have a lot of listeners out there in the pet dog community, and a lot of people questioning, like, "Oh, would this be a good breed to bring in as a family dog?" And some of the crap you read on the online make it seem like some of these breeds would be a great choice. And we just kind of wanted to, as a blanket statement, if you're an average Joe family, these are breeds that you shouldn't consider. Yeah, and one thing, I mean, I had, you know, these, the guarding dogs, uh, you have to be really careful of. And the, the chow. You want to go that route now? Yeah, well, okay. I, mean, I was like, going to go the chow thinking, next. I was yeah, going to, let's any, do the chow Any next. dog that's bred to guard property mm -hmm. that really, you know, had a reputation, comes with this reputation of protecting. Mm -hmm. That means they're not out chasing, they're not herding sheep, and, you know, they're, they're just sitting on the front lawn, holding their ground, waiting for someone to climb over the fence into the yard where their job is just to terminate. Yeah. Just take care of them. And that's yeah. what they were like, you know, a thousand years ago, 500 yeah. years and, ago. And I mean, Chow is our fourth breed that we're going to say is not a good breed to have with children. The last bite that you endured of any real magnitude was from a Chow. I, I'm yeah. just going to put that out there. This yeah. isn't because we're going against the breed, but Scott doesn't get bit that often. I don't get bit that often. It was out of nowhere. That dog got returned because it got it returned a to a rescue because the owner said it had too much hair. Well, I, I'm sorry if you and Google it came to a me Chow. Because of aggression. Yeah, if you Google a Chow, clearly they're going to have hair. And online, this isn't an AKC thing because AKC isn't you know, big on putting breeds down. But in general, it says chow chows tend to display discernment of strangers and can become fiercely protective of their owners and properties. That's often what we've seen. Chows frequently come with that purple tongue. There may be some chow in a mix if they have a purple tongue. And that doesn't mean, oh my God, it's aggressive and we got to get rid of this dog and this is a problem. But more often than not, if we're going to be dealing with chows in a professional dog training environment, there's going to be some level of aggression there, some level of territorial aggression. And this this specific dog that we had in had no problem going after kids or adults, and they're not necessarily discerning the size of the person, similar to the Akita. If they're protective and they're protective of the family, it's anything that comes on the property. So if you are a chow lover, and again, you're going to be having your grandkids over or your best friend just had a kid, and you know that person is going to be over at your house multiple times a week and everything else, maybe wait a few years to get a chow, maybe, or do just a multitude of research, just like a deep dive into different breeders. Maybe you get one that's older, that has already been proven to be more, you know, docile with children and everything else. Clearly there's going to be exceptions to every rule, but as a general rule, if you always wanted a chow and you're planning on getting pregnant in the next few years, do not get a chow during those years. Yeah. And when you get into these, uh, guard dog type of dogs, uh, a lot of times you will find that family they're good with everybody in the house it could be kids too they're just there and you're part of their pack and they're great but everybody has people come to the property you know yeah. everybody has their yeah, kids they're going to bring their friends over and all of a sudden something happened out of the blue with a dog that is perfect with your family yeah. you never saw that behavior yeah but this and is a stranger they don't like the way this person's acting and they're making some bad choices and if it's a small dog or another let me just say not a small dog but a non-guard dog, they may have some fear and some territorial aggression. They'll bark, but they're retreating as they're barking. Yeah. A lot of these guard dogs, they don't even bark. Yeah. They just, they just come right in. in, boom. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's, and, you don't get a lot of warning in that case. And that's a great point. You know, be great with the family. You may have to put them up when you're having people over. It, it can be something as simple as the electric meter guy coming over to on the meter and there's an incident. If there's a party, you know, you need to be putting the dog away at certain times. But the last thing anyone wants to deal with is a homeowner's insurance claim and then this Forget issue. That. 
you know, animal control and the dog and injuring someone else and maybe having to euthanize your dog. Like, it's just a whole tumble of sadness. The worst thing is the trauma, of sadness. the trauma to the person that gets bit. That's the worst, in my mind, that's the worst thing, the, the physical damage and the emotional trauma that that child, God forbid, has to live with. The second thing is putting your dog in sucks. The third thing is now the lawsuits. Yeah. You know, possible civil problems and yeah. criminal issues. A lot, a lot of financial fallout. A lot of a lot of financial and emotional fallout. All right, number five. Um, this was on my list. It wasn't on Scott's list, but we agreed upon this one. The Cane Corso. Let's talk a little bit about the Cane Corso. Well, it falls into the same category, a guard dog. Yeah. And also, you're getting a dog now that's 100 plus pounds. And whenever you get, that's the thing, you get these dogs. Big. Certain Mastiffs, Mastiff lines, American Bulldogs, you get into these big 100 plus pound dogs that sometimes can get a little just they're, they have that aggression in them, and um, they got a lot of fight in them, and they don't have a lot of endurance. That's the thing about the big dogs. They don't yeah. have the endurance to like chase a, 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 an animal down like a rabbit. They wait, but then when they bite, they put all their energy into immobilizing what it is that they just got their teeth into. Yeah. And it's really hard to break those type of dogs up if they get into a dog fight. I mean, that's why they have the break sticks for some of these big breeds with incredible jaw strength that do not want to release. Yeah. And it can get nasty. I mean, I remember like 30 years ago, those two press of canarios killed a woman in San Francisco. It was a huge national story. I wasn't even familiar really with press of canarios until that story happened because they're such an intense dog. Nobody owned them. Are we moving on from Cane Corso to press of canario? Because yeah. we can. All right. Yeah. Number six, press of canario. <laughs> Um, another huge on. dog. Well, we were in Cane Corso, and then you went to Presa Canario all on your own. Very similar. Similar. Very similar. But also breeds, and I guess Scott's kind of like, hey, why are you going after the dog daddy? These are breeds sometimes that are popping up. These bigger breeds that he's training, they're gaining more popularity. Like, oh, that dog looks really cool and everything else. These are not good family dogs. These are not dogs that the average pet owner should own. This does not mean that these breeds should be discontinued, and they are not being reputably, reputably bred. But the Cane Corso, the Presa Canario, all these types of dogs takes a dog-savvy owner, and it's a whole other world of owning a dog when we're talking about size, aggression, damage that can happen, tolerance of heat. All of these things impact it. So go back to your Presa Canario story. No, I, the- if, like in that case, they were using these dogs for protection. They were, they were teaching them to bite. They were doing regular bite sessions with these dogs. They were a lot of dog, and they were bred to really do what they enjoyed doing. And I would say anybody that's buying a dog for self-defense or to protect themselves, to give themselves a feeling of protection and to protect their family, first of all, it's better to have a dog that just barks and doesn't bite and have a firearm in the house. If you seriously get issues with someone that you're worried about, the dog's going to alert you. Someone's there at an off hour, two in the morning, someone's around your property. That's giving you the opportunity to dial 911 to get your firearm out of its secure place and deal with the situation. Yeah. That's the way I would handle it. Yeah, yeah. That is we, the last thing that we ever want, and it's not that you don't want our like dogs a, your daughter's us. boyfriend is like sneaking over. Hey, yeah. maybe I'll, I'll toss a pebble at her window. Yeah. Next what, thing you know, you let the friggin' press out what, the door. What generation are you living in? Pebbles at the the girl the daughter's window. <laughs> <laughs> That's old I did that on more than one occasion. Well, that was that was generations <laughs> ago. But literally, like they just text now. They just ping or whatever. But like these types of situations, also, I just want to put out there that a dog that's going to go in a grass, especially if the uh, person coming in or breaking in has a weapon, if it isn't the boyfriend, the theoretical situation of that. We don't ever want our dogs to be in a situation where they're going to get hurt. Like, we don't want to be sending our dogs to someone that has a knife or a gun or something else. That's not what we're thinking about. So, Cane Corso, press a Canario, not good family dogs, you guys. Uh, and in conclusion, with the protection dogs, of course, the Malinois would be your, your first choice for a real protection dog because they're smart and controllable enough and actually will do their job. So, if okay. you're going to get a protection dog, get a trained well, dog that's, that's preferred that's not by right. military police and everybody else because of the reliability of the dog. All right, before we move and on. Stability. Bef- <laughs> that's number seven on our list, so maybe we should have talked about this more. Well, you um, the right dog. Canario, I just want to mention this. Some of the breed traits, suspiciousness, stubbornness, they're strong-willed, they're dominant. These are all these types of traits that you hear that you're like, oh, I want a dog like that. I, these are not traits that mix well with children. We do not want those types of traits mixing well with children. Okay, so we're saying now that uh, Mal is a good dog to have as a protection dog. That's theoretically true. 
Mouths are not good dogs to raise with young children. I am sorry. I, and that does not mean, I'm saying this right now, very, 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 very openly and honestly. That does not mean that you are irresponsible being a very savvy dog trainer who, you know, competes with these dogs at various levels and different sports and everything else. And you know what you're doing, that you're being irresponsible having kids and Malinois in the same house. Malinois take a different level of ownership in regards to knowing the breed, knowing the trainability of the breed, training the breed properly, giving the dog the right outlet and everything else. So you'll see a lot of these higher end people competing in protection sports that have young kids in Malinois. And I totally support that. I'm not saying that that is an issue. These are experienced trainers. Many of them are professional dog trainers as a profession, in addition to being competitors. So you'll see this kind of stuff popping up online. That doesn't mean that it's going to translate okay to your home. And flat out, the responsible Malinois breeders, if you contact them and you say, hey, you know, I have a two-year-old and I'm pregnant with my second child and we'd really like to get a protection dog for the house. Can we get on a list for, you know, a dog in a year or two? All the responsible Malinois breeders that I know are going to say, you're not a candidate for that breed. I'm sorry. You're going to have to go elsewhere. Some of the dogs that Scott's talking about is these protection dogs. They're, you know, trained and they're sold at an older age for a higher price and everything else. But most Malinois breeders, if they're doing their job correctly, they're going to be excluding people that we're describing on the podcast that would be looking for this dog. The Malinois look cool. They're a great dog. They took down the, wasn't that Osama the Afghanistan? Yeah, they, they, did, no. they did that. I think, yeah, they got him. Yeah, they did that. The, the movie Dog, everyone was worried that the popularity of the Mal was going to go crazy and there were going to be this influx of Mal's. I haven't seen that a whole lot. Maybe other people have seen that in the country. They are not for the faint of heart. Honestly, we own one Malinois right now. We may never own a Malinois again as a couple or me individually. I don't know. There, there are a lot of dog to own, and we are a very dog-savvy home. That And Scott's owned Malinois for how many years now? Yeah, over 20, 25 yeah. years. And again, Scott raised his. I've always his. had at least one yes. and sometimes and two Scott's, or three. Scott had three young children when his were going on, and yeah. God forbid there were never any incidents with the Mal's. It's not that it can't go okay. And you may have more of a show line bred one, and you're just telling me, like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they're putting down the Malinois and everything else. In general, even if this dog does not have outward aggression, they have a lower frustration tolerance. One of their go-to things is to use their mouth to communicate. We had Andy Dietz on the podcast for 2022 Dog of the Year with his Malinois. He's out there telling people publicly, like, they're not just a dog for your average Joe household. They have a young child in the house, too. Yes. Again, responsible, capable trainers, not just your average Joe. And uh, I know at least one breeder that has a, a daughter that is now a teenager and raise that kid with Malinois, always having litters and all that stuff. But breeders and, and responsible Malinois owners, they're always, I think, the key there is they're always six steps ahead of what their dog yes, is thinking. Yes. They know before anything happens, what could happen, what may happen, yeah. you know, how that person may act, what your dog may do. So they're always ahead of the curve. And that's why they don't have problems. You know? And even being ahead of the curve, there's always sometimes some things can happen but it's at uh, at best, it's a close call. It's yeah. not a problem. Yeah, and they're very Johnny on the spot with seeing those things. And frequently, these people, especially if they're breeders, the dogs weren't only you know conceived at the house; they were born in the house, and they're molding those puppies into what they want for the family right from the get go. They're not getting a Malinois at six months old or whatever, and then bringing it into the family dynamic. They're a lot of dog to own, and you have to be very conscious about them. It's not a big flex to own a Malinois, even if you are a bachelor. Like I'd prefer you to go get a pit bull and you know have a pit bull and enjoy a pit bull. Malinois are not for the faint of heart. They yeah. are even hard for a lot of police departments to handle at this point because there's so much dog. So be conscious. Yeah, and I will say in closing on the Malinois that uh, there was a, an incident with a breeder a few years back where the the owner went off. He was he was away for a week, and he had a local teenager taking care of the dogs, and it was a horrendous story. But the something happened, and these were young Malinois too. Yeah. But this kid was killed, and uh, it was a terrible tragedy. Yeah. And it wouldn't have happened with six or 10 or 12 Labrador Retrievers. Yeah. It just wouldn't have happened. Yeah, just be conscious. That's the bottom line. Be conscious of the breed. Not a good breed with young kids. Okay, moving on. I feel like this is kind of a downer podcast, but we really want to put this information out there for you guys to consider, absorb, and share with other loved ones and friends. Number eight is going to be the Rottweiler. 
not a good dog with young children. Of course, again, there will be exceptions to the rule. They look really cool. They're really awesome dogs. They are not a good dog for first-time dog owners, not super savvy dog people. Going back to the 2021 list, there were 535 attacks and over 80 deaths with, with Rottweilers alone. When we're talking about deaths... Big, powerful dog. Yes. When we're talking about attacks leading to death, this is a whole nother situation. And Rotties, I mean, they're more diluted now, I would say, when they're bred. They're you can not... get a good Rottie still. I, st- I yeah. like Rotties. They're really nice yeah, dogs. Yeah, you do like them. But they are interesting that depending on the genetics, they can be just big teddy bears or they can have a side to them that you not just kind cute. of like start scaring everybody, you yeah, know? Yeah, not and, cute. And uh, again, I remember back in like 2002 when I was in California, I, right, the community right next to where I lived, this woman was in her front yard with a newborn baby in her arms with a Rottweiler, and she's on the phone talking, and that friggin' dog jumped up and ripped that baby out of her arms and killed the kid. Yeah. And it was just a friggin' horrendous yeah. heart. These are like the thing. types of things that like make you sick to your stomach. You don't sleep for weeks. The like kid was probably crying, yeah. acting like a kid. Yeah, exactly. And who knows? Again, we can call this prey, not human aggression, or anything else. It doesn't matter. It doesn't translate on the other end if we're talking about a child being seriously mauled, seriously traumatized, or even worse, at the end of the day, being killed. That is not okay in our minds. And I would say I mean, you can Google news stories and pit bulls will definitely be the first breed that pops up. I would say the second most common news story is going to be from Rotties with kids. Like that is, that's another common one. And maybe that's just more buzz. And of course, they're more popular than the Cane Corso or the Presa Canary or something else. But Rottweilers in general are not a smart move with young children. If you have one, if you have stable ones, if you're living with them comfortably with your kids right now, there's exceptions to every rule. We are just trying to say in general, if this is the dog you always wanted, maybe wait until your kids are teenagers, maybe wait until your kids go to college, whatever else, be very conscious of young children and Rottweilers because it can end in heartbreak. Yeah, and I would say that the Rottweiler is, there is a lot more exceptions with that breed because there's a ton of great Rottweilers out there that are very social, awesome dogs. They look scary as hell, even though they're social, but they just, like, there was one lady, uh, just to, (laughs) (laughs) I was in Dover, this lady, she's like 75, and she goes, "I I can't control my Rottweiler. Can you come help me? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I, she, the dog's like 120 pounds. Yeah. And she goes, I just can't hold him back. And like, they, UPS won't come to my house anymore. FedEx won't come to my house. And I come, I said, make sure the friggin' dog is like tied to a tree when I get there. Something. Because she said she couldn't hold the dog. And she says, the dog's really social. It's just pull, you know, just wants to say hello to everybody. Which you can't take that at face value. Because yeah. people don't know what they're looking at. And it turns out this dog was hugely social. So the second time I went to the house... I knew she couldn't hold the dog back. I said, just let the dog come out of the house. I'll be in the driveway. So I took my cat, my phone and I videotaped this 120 pound Roddy just running at me at a, as fast as it could go. As soon as it gets to me, it's just eating a piece of cheese, all happy, <laughs> wiggling yeah. and happy yeah. to see me. Yeah. But the problem was he was just so big, she couldn't control the physical size of that dog. Yeah, you know? and that is another tidbit here. Even if you have a super social one, Rotties are more wiggly than a lot of these breeds we're talking about. When we're talking about young children, like trying to walk and stuff, you don't want a wiggly, wiggly Rottweiler butt smashing them to the floor. There's just general things here with large breeds and young children That's also. That's no big deal. <laughs> I, I mean, I got an English I, Mastiff for my kids, and the biggest problem A professional was, dog trainer, the, well, again. No, the, do, the dog would hurt the kids with its tail. Yeah. Just whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Okay. Go ahead. All right. We are going to go after a small breed here, and then we're going to go to our final this miscellaneous category. This is the most dangerous category. dog you Legitimately, you guys, number nine, and this is not in any order. This is just our top <laughs> ten list. It's true. I, well, I, uh, that's one of the most aggressive dogs we've ever trained. Our number Certainly. nine is a Chihuahua. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, again, not to say you're not out there living with chihuahuas or chihuahua mixes that are not amazing with children and your grandchildren and everything else. We are happy for you. Praise you. In general, chihuahuas can be very, very, very nasty little dogs. They often get away with a ton because their bites are not going to do as much damage as some of these they, larger they breeds that we're talking about. Damage. Yeah, like, and it's like, imagine a rat, but with big teeth. No, it's it's true. You guys, it's not a joke. And the most aggressive dog I've ever trained with you was a Chihuahua. You and Adrian had a really tough one in yeah. California. Like, I mean, this is not just like, oh, they're going after the Chihuahua. A purebred Chihuahua can be a motherfucker. So be very conscious of Chihuahuas around young kids. And we talk about 
the AKC and how they're so, you know, loving towards all breeds and everything else. If you look at a Chihuahua specifically, it says not recommended with children. That is their, like, their scale. It, it, it's on the far end of not recommended with children. So if you love them and they're a dog for you and everything else and you always have had them and you're having grandkids and the dog's nasty with your grandkid, condition the dog to the crate, get the dog so the kid is safe. But that mix of like, oh, it's a small dog, it's a small child, a Chihuahua can do a ton of damage to a young face that is, you know, growing and everything else. That or young even an tissue. Adult's face, yeah. An adult's face. Any face skin is very soft and you can just rip a hunk of it off real easy. Yeah. Uh, but the nice thing with adults is that if they're not bending down and sticking their hand in the dog's face, it's just going to be an ankle biter. Yeah. Which isn't really doing any harm to anybody. It's yeah. when you get a two, three year old kid there that all of a sudden he's right at that level where yeah. he's going to get hurt. And I mean, I know of people um, who have gotten bit as young children. The trauma with dogs in general. My cousin was bit by a golden retriever. Your mother was bit by a dog when she was young. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not something that kids forget. Like, it, it really, with you, yes. Yeah. And then it just gives trauma, you know, towards all dogs and all breeds. And it's just, it's not a good experience for the dog, the kid, anything. So, chihuahuas and young children especially if there's any aggression issues, not a good mix, not something we recommend. Yeah, I've often said when I do wind up working with a Chihuahua, and inevitably they just got so much character and they're very tenacious. And, yeah, they are and they are, they are trainable and all that stuff, but I always say, I always wind up saying at some point, <laughs> if this dog's brain was in a... 80 pound dog, it would be put to sleep immediately. Yeah, it's true. Because it's just too much there and it's just like not quitting. I'm just going in and I'm going to do what I want to yeah, do. Yeah, and you'll see like, you know, the chihuahuas, I'm thinking maybe like some city dogs or whatever, they're in harnesses, they're going crazy, they're losing their mind with other animals. Then they just get picked up, you know what I mean? And maybe then they're batshit crazy in the owner's arms, but they're so small they can be managed but some serious, serious, nasty aggression. Like some of the aggression that's been very hard for us to get on top of. So and a lot be conscious. of it is just spoiled too, but it's still... You know, you can only, it doesn't, you can raise, and I say this to people all the time, they have a dog that is spoiled rotten that also has a lot of aggression. And it's breed specific too, because you could spoil the crap out of, you know, a golden retriever as an example. And it will be a big spoiled dog, but it's not just nailing everybody. And that would be an outlier. Yeah. When you get a golden retriever that's biting the crap out of people, that's not normal within the breed standard, whether they're spoiled or not. Yeah. It's just like that's not their go-to. Yeah. You know? I would say whenever we deal with chihuahuas in our profession, it's because of aggression. So not a good mix with kids. All right. Number 10. And this is kind of our miscellaneous category. We're going to call this the miscellaneous herding breed category. And I'm having trouble... We're having trouble going after any specific herding breeds. And obviously the Malinois had its own category. I have no problem saying all day long, mals and young kids are not a good mix. So they get their own category in addition to the miscellaneous herding breed. But in our miscellaneous herding breed, we're talking about like border collies, corgis, Australian cattle dogs, German shepherds, maybe old English sheepdogs, Beaucerons. And there are going to be exceptions to every rule. I've had Border Collies since I was three years old. I was basically raised with Border Collie puppies. I know a lot of people that have corgis and kids, and it works out great. These herding breeds in general, and it's typically not so much aggression as it is like, oh, the kid's running around, and, you know, it's winter coat, and it's snow pants, and the dogs are like, it's corgis especially, like jumping up to grab it. It's more of this, like, ankle-biting, herding behavior, you know, putting the dogs into corners and everything else. If you are not savvy with dogs, if you are not savvy with herding breeds, if you are not savvy with these breeds specifically, and you have young children in the home, we would recommend that you avoid them. And that does not mean every herding breed. There's a lot more herding breeds out there than what I mentioned. But in general, that's kind of the hot list for us. That's more of the, That can be more of an issue than some other dogs. Yeah, I would say out of all the herding breeds, I mean, if you were to get one, that would be probably the safest. It would be uh, getting a German Shepherd. Because they have been bred to work with people. They're much more trainable than... You it know, depends, like, though, their genetics. And if oh, we're going back to that list, you know, there were 113 attacks with German Shepherds alone in 2021. And those resulted in 15 deaths. So, I mean, yeah. it really... If you're not savvy with the breed and it hasn't... You're not very familiar with the genetics and you're not very, you know, intertwined That's, with the breeder and the breeder's not being very honest with you and the breeder's not super aware of their genetics... It's not a good breed to bring into your home. It's a big freaking dog. Yeah, if they're not asking any questions and just shipping puppies out to everyone that yeah, send them money, concerning. that could be a problem. Concerning. But I, what, I, you're right, you're right. I just think that a German Shepherd that's decently bred is going to be the most stable Yeah, out when of is the many, last time many... we saw a decently bred Shepherd, though, is yeah. the problem, especially pet dog status. Well, I mean, as opposed to, I'm thinking about a Border Collie. You know, we have a house full of Border Collies. They have certain um, ticks, I would say, as a breed 
that are pretty consistent. Yeah. And if you know border collies, it's not an issue. Yeah. But you know they can be you know they're they're motion sensitive and they can. They have can some, be, but I, if know, we're gonna go of, that route, I would say border collies and young kids. Half the time you give the young kid a tennis ball and they just use the crap out of the kid. Like they, they love the kid. They're like, hey, you do this, I do this, we do this, I do this. I mean, they're all going to have their different nuances. Australian kettle dogs, one of the most dog aggressive dogs we've ever trained is an Australian kettle dog. We are doing follow-ups with her again this year. We talked about him last year a lot on the podcast. She just sent us a photo of her and her like eight or 10 year old son, like doing these like breathing meditation exercises before bed. It it doesn't mean that every Australian cattle dog is not going to mix well with children just because this dog has dog aggression doesn't mean he's going to be an ass with kids. But as a general rule, if you are not like, oh yeah, I really have a deep understanding of this breed, like a deep understanding of this breed. I really know this breed. I know some triggers. I know what I need to deal with. If you are not that kind of person and familiar enough with these breeds, do not bring that type of breed into your house with a small child. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I'm thinking about just with the trainer's mindset, but for the average com- yeah. companion animal, people don't want to become dog trainers. No, They don't want to be training all the time and doing this stuff and then throwing the dog in a crate for no other reason yeah. than to keep them acclimated to a crate. People yeah. don't do that. They don't want to live that way. And yeah. I don't blame them one yeah. bit. And and it's not that you don't have shepherds or your parents don't have shepherds that aren't amazing with your children. No, we're not trying. And this is why this is the miscellaneous herding breed category. We're just trying to p- kind of put them all down at once. It's just a buyer beware. And, you know, I said as the last question, who should you trust when it comes to making the right decision when bringing a dog into your family? If you are a hardcore corgi person and, you know, you can have the Pembroke Welsh corgi or the other corgi. What's the other one? I don't know. There's the Pembroke and the other one. Um, the cardigan. You can have either of those corgis and, you know, this is, there's two different types of corgis. You can have, you know, border collies, all of this other thing. Talk to the breeder. If this is your go-to, like, this is my dog, I'm not changing. I think the queen had corgis. Like, she was a corgi woman. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. that was her scene. If this is who you are as a person and you're like, I am not fluctuating away from this breed, even though that I'm bringing, you know, I have one young kid, we want to have at least another child or two, you know, in the next few years, talk to the breeder about what your expectations are, what you want, you know, the different temperaments of these genetics that they carry, everything else, do your research. And the breeder should be able to exclude you from this, right? Like they should say that, that lineage, this cross is going to be way too much dog, way too much drive for your family. This is a more diluted mix. Let me see if there's a puppy that I think may, you know, mix in better. So really, and please do not get any of these dogs from rescue if you have young kids or honestly, in general, I'm not trying to put breed specific rescue down, but these specific herding breeds normally, like if you don't know where they come from and they end back up in rescue, they're not necessarily a great lifelong companion for you. So be very conscious of really having a strong relationship with your breeder, strong, like opinion on your expectations and ha- make sure the breeder's honest with you. They're not just like, oh yeah, all my dogs are great with kids. Here's the deposit. And you know, I'll get you a puppy within six months. Anytime it goes that smoothly, especially with young children going to be in the house with these types of breeds, be conscious of it. Anything else you have to say about herding breeds? Well, I mean, getting back to Malinois being a herder, I had a, um, and this, again, I can only go, I'm, I'm jaded because this is all real life experience with different families all over the, you know, in LA and in, in Mass and New Hampshire and Maine and all over New England. But I had a guy show up, very successful business person with his family, with young kids, with a Malinois puppy. And this puppy was like eight or nine weeks old with a lot of aggression. And I said, this isn't a good puppy if you guys send it back. Just turn around and send it back. That's my best advice to you. Good puppy for police work, military work, protection dog. He said, well, I want to have it for a protection dog. And I said, yeah, yeah, but this, this puppy is too strong for you. I, don't, I didn't get where I am today by giving up. This was his big argument. And I'm going to make this work, and I want you to help me train the dog. So I said, all right. And I took the dog in for a board and train, and the um, dog was really nice. I mean, the dog trained really well, really good dog. And sure enough, when that dog got to be about seven months old, it bit the nanny. And then the kids were out playing basketball in the driveway. And this puppy scaled a six-foot fence and attacked one of the kid's friends. I mean, the dog had like seven or eight bites before he's calling me saying, I'm in a, I'm in a tough position. I try to send the dog back to the breeder who's on the other side of the country. The airlines won't touch this friggin' dog now because the dog had so much aggression Couldn't take the dog out of the crate to check the crate to stuff him back in to send him on cargo. They wouldn't take him. They said, the dog is too aggressive for us. I said, I don't know what to tell you. You know, I'm not going to, 
I can't take the dog myself. Yeah. And he was, you know, he spent like a year, over a year of his life with a dog that he did the best he could with. It wasn't the right fit, wasn't the right breed for his family. And it was heartbreak for everybody yeah, involved. Everybody's bummed so, out. So, yeah, yeah, like the more upfront you are from the get-go, the better. And, I mean, again, I just, I really want to say... We are not trying to put anyone down. Scott was very hesitant to do this podcast. He's like, oh my God, you know, all the Rottweiler breeders are going to well, listen no, the, and think the, we're assholes. There's so and- many exceptions to all the dogs we talk about. You yeah. know, I've been to houses with all of these breeds where I come in with a little prejudgment, like, okay, this is an American bulldog. Uh, they've tried to kill me before. <laughs> and the dog's a big teddy bear. I'm like, yeah. oh, good. I, this <laughs> dog is fine. You know, so yeah. it, it's always going to be dog specific, but as general rules, and again, as general rules, if you get a lab, we're not saying like everything signed, sealed, delivered. You're going to have to be monitoring kids and dogs at all times. You're going to have to be doing proper training. You're going to have to look for the correct genetics. This is not a one size fits all, but in general, that is our top 10 list. And I know 10 spilled over to a lot of miscellaneous herding breeds, but that's where we stand. And we would just say as a general PSA, if you have young children and you are planning on having young children, this is not a good mix. Or if you are an older, you know, couple that's going to be having grandkids over, or you're a freaking nanny, like let's not, let's not mix these breeds and animals, the wolf hybrid with young children. Okay. Next week, we are doing an episode with Dog Mom Mentality. We already recorded with her. Honestly, I think it's our best discussion about mental health that we've had yet on the podcast. I so enjoyed having her on. I'm wearing her shirt, Bad Dog Mom. We just had a great talk with her. And um, we will see you then in May. And in the meantime, keep, keep it quirky. quirky. Bye, guys. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.